Welcome to Run the Adventure, a podcast about getting the most out of published modules for your tabletop role-playing game. I'm your host, Sid Razavi. Every episode, I take a look at a module to show you where the fun is and how you might want to tweak it to suit your game. I hope even if you decide not to play this particular adventure, you will get some interesting ideas out of it. The following content is aimed at Games Masters, or players who want to be Games Masters. So if this is a module you are going to play, this is the point when it's customary to warn you about spoilers. But if you're ready to step behind the screen, then there is no better time to start than right now. I've been running games for over 30 years now, but my aim with every episode is to put myself in the shoes of a new GM. As well as breaking down the scenario and how it plays, I'll be peppering the discussion with useful advice for the relatively new GM who has to try to run this for their group. I hope the discussion will prove interesting for veteran GMs as well, those who are looking for ideas for their own games. Okay, now all that is said, let's get to this episode's adventure. In this episode, I'm back to talking about Call of Cthulhu, with a scenario that is included in the 7th edition starter set. Edge of Darkness often competes with The Haunting, subject of the second episode of this pod, for the best introduction for a group of players getting into Call of Cthulhu. There is the usual setup of an old friend or colleague who brings the investigators into the mystery. Then, a time for investigating. Then, the investigators travel to the site of the strangeness, with a chance to interact with some of the locals. Finally, a dramatic confrontation with the mythos occurs in the form of a ritual that must be performed at great risk. The beats are familiar, and the scenario offers reach for a deep experience that is distinctive. However, unlike the haunting, you will need to put in a bit of work to get the most out of this scenario. Summary of the adventure. The investigators are called by their dying friend, Rupert Merriweather, to St. Mary's Teaching Hospital in downtown Arkham. There, the dying Merriweather lays it on them that as a younger man, he and his friends dabbled in the dark arts, performing a magical ritual that summoned something evil into this world. The thing they summoned remains trapped in the farmhouse where they conducted their experiments. That is, until the last of the ritual casters, Rupert, dies. Then woe to the world, the evil thing will break free. So Rupert has called his younger friends to his side to do the one thing he never had the bravery to complete to go back to the farmhouse and perform the ritual that will send the evil thing back to wherever it came from. With this off his chest, Merriweather dies in dramatic fashion. He bequeathed to the investigators a box with a letter, his journal, the deed and keys to the farmhouse, plus a strange sarcophagus-shaped box with occult inscriptions etched into it. These heirlooms begin the investigation. The letter is the obvious starting point, and recaps much of what Merriweather told the investigators in person. There are opportunities to find out more about the Dark Brotherhood, the group that Merriweather was a part of. They can follow the leads to learn about the death of their leader, Marion Allen, with trips to the police and the coroner's office. There are also opportunities to visit the archaeology department and university library to learn more about the sarcophagus. These research trips help add colour to the scenario and warn the investigators that something of the mythos is going on here. But they are all in a way inessential to the main task at hand. For everything the investigators need to perform the ritual is in papers left at the farmhouse. The party will then head to Ross's Corner, the small farming community where the farmhouse is located. If the investigators interact with the locals, they will find them dour and unfriendly. Those with a keen eye for observing human behaviour will detect that something is up, that they are holding something back. The local general store will be their best hope of getting information about what is going on in Ross's Corner. 
run by Ma Peters, a friendly enough sort, a polite, upstanding investigator who applies a bit of charm or fast talking, will find out that one of the locals, Maggie McFurter, went missing the previous night when she was checking on her horses. Some may worry that the husband is to blame for Maggie's disappearance, but investigators may be more intrigued by the fact that McFurter's farm is next to the farmhouse the investigators now own. When they get to the farmhouse, they begin to see signs that someone has been there more recently than when the ritual was first performed all those years ago. A wanderer named Red Jake made the mistake of bedding down in the farmhouse last night. Then, smelling something foul in the attic and hearing noises that made him scared, he made a run for it, chased by something he could not see. He was saved by the arrival of Maggie McVerter, which distracted whatever was chasing him. Today, Jake returned to the farmhouse to collect his meagre possessions just before the investigators arrive. Already spooked, Jake went to hide in the cellar. There he waits until he can make his escape. Unless, of course, the investigators go down to the cellar, in which case he will make a wild attack and try to flee. A desperate, homeless man is one danger, but the true monster is the lurker in the attic. Once the party have gone down to the cellar and dealt with Red Jake one way or another, they can retrieve the materials necessary for performing the ritual inside a trunk prepared by the Dark Brotherhood. This includes a pile of yellowed papers containing the instructions on how to use everything. The ritual can only be done at midnight, and by this time the lurker will have gone hunting outside. The magic that wards the farmhouse prevents it from directly attacking the investigators inside. But this doesn't prevent it from sensing the ritual is being performed and trying to coax the investigators out. Failing that, it will reanimate the corpses of those animals and people it has recently killed and send them to attack the investigators inside the house. If the investigators can hold their nerve and make sure at least one of them continues to perform the ritual at all times whilst fending off the lurker's minions, they will banish the creature back to whatever hell it came from. Adventure Structure The scenario begins with some useful advice about the kind of investigators the players should have prepared. The starter set does come with some pre-gens, which may or may not be used at the Keeper's discretion. These pre-gens will belong to the Society for the Exploration of the Unexplained, which gives them an obvious reason to get involved. When I ran this, I allowed my players to roll their own and to find some connection to Merryweather instead. This was to be, for my investigators, the first experience of the weird before being invited to join the paranormal club at Miskatonic University. That is, if they survived. The Keeper's introduction follows, and this is mercifully brief, as much of the background for this scenario is provided in the lengthy handouts available. It is an interesting aspect of the scenario that the players get told basically the same information several times in different ways. First, Merryweather tells them face to face. Then they can read it in a letter from Merryweather. Then they can read about it in Merryweather's journal. And they may also rediscover aspects of the same things with some additional details as part of their research. If your players haven't got the details of what happened at that farmhouse all those years ago by the end of the scenario, they were probably fast asleep. After absorbing the letter and journal, the investigators can go off to find what other information they can. They can find enough newspaper clippings to validate the publicly known parts of Merriweather's story. Notably from the newspaper archives and police authorities, they can get some of the details of Marion Allen's death. This was particularly gruesome, and the coroner's report suggests something unusual was done to him after his death. Exactly who was responsible is left unresolved. A potential hook for future adventures, perhaps. Studying the sarcophagus box will take some time and can be helped by Professor Warren Rice, who works at the university. 
The translated text on the outside of the box alludes to mythos entities that were invoked in the ritual. As for the writing on the inside, there is no hope of translating them, as they are in a dead alien language that no investigator or even Professor Rice is going to be able to read. Another avenue of research is the Miskatonic University's library, with its extensive volumes on the occult. There, more of the background material for the sarcophagus can be found, as can a rare copy of Die Vermi Mysterie, which is kept in the restricted section of the library. Getting access to this volume will require convincing the head of the library, Dr. Henry Armitage, who may be familiar to readers of Lovecraft's The Dunwich Horror. Whilst these investigations give the feel of a Call of Cthulhu game, which is an essential part of an introductory adventure to the system, they lack any sense of jeopardy. Nothing hangs on whether the investigators perform them or indeed find any of the clues. This does take the pressure off when considering how players will perform or what will interest them or indeed whether the dice are with them on the night. But I think this goes a little too far and in retrospect may feel a little bit of a waste of time. The section on Ross's Corner comes next, and it is fairly brief with Ma Peter's general store, the only meaningful interaction point. This is a good spot for players to pick up any supplies they may have forgotten to pack. It is also a good chance for some social skills to come out. Finding out about Maggie McFurter is a great clue to uncover. Not only will it hint that something is on the prowl in the area, probably the thing Meriwether summoned, but it will also set up the encounter with Maggie later when she is risen from the dead. The scenario covers the farmhouse next, starting with environments around the house proper. There are plenty of clues to uncover in the vegetable garden and surrounding woodland if the investigators think to look there. There is also a barn whose rusty old equipment provides a nasty trap for clumsy investigators. Finally, approaching the house itself will make an investigator with a bit of cult skills twitchy as it has been covered in mystic wards. Inside the farmhouse, we have the front and back rooms, plus the attic and the cellar. Investigators have walked into a tense situation without necessarily knowing it. Red Jake is frightened, desperate, a man who just wants to get his stuff and get out of there. Meanwhile, the investigators may also be on edge for whatever Merriweather summoned. When Jake attacks, they may mistake him for the thing. If they manage to avoid killing him and he doesn't get away, he may provide some information about what happened last night at the farm. However, if he gets away, he's likely to be hunted by the lurker and return in a zombified form later that night. Up in the attic, the lurker will remain silent, waiting and observing. If an investigator does go up to the trap door, it will then attempt to grab them. An unlucky investigator, or one who fails to dodge, will be horribly mauled by it before falling back down into the front room. If this manages to kill the investigator, their corpse will be lifted back up by the invisible lurker. Watching the compatriot butchered and dragged up by an invisible hand will certainly test the investigator's sanity. The cellar is where all the pieces will fall together in terms of performing the ritual that dismisses the lurker back to its hell dimension. Everything the investigators need is in the trunk, including a magic powder that will make the lurker visible for a short time as it burns. Once the ritual is started, the lurker will be alerted to the investigator's intent. It cannot directly interfere as long as they stay in the warded room. However, it will do everything in its power to lure the investigators out to disrupt the ritual. This includes animating the dead animals and corpses nearby to using waves of zombie attacks. It will also mimic the loved ones of the investigators to try to get them to come out from the protection of the ward. These sanity-draining events will test the resolve of the investigators. As long as one of them maintains the ritual, it will proceed to success. They will pour their magic points into it until the ritual is complete. However, if they break the casting, they will soon find themselves in a very sticky situation. 
One aspect of the mechanics of performing this ritual in the game that is encouraged is to have some means to denote players who are maintaining the ritual and those who are doing other things. In person, you might use a hand on the head or some other physical sign that the player character is chanting. Online, you might simply ask players who are chanting to remain muted and not type in the chat. Whatever mechanism you use to define the player that is maintaining the chanting required for the ritual, it needs to be clear that breaking the ritual will have consequences. Without it, the ritual will likely proceed without much interruption or being very interesting. If the investigators succeed in completing the ritual, they will banish the lurker and can pat themselves on the back for a job well done. If they don't, well, this is Call of Cthulhu. It's likely death or madness for them. Where the fun is at. The first highlight of the adventure for me was the encounter with Red Jake. After setting up expectations with Mar Peters that something wild and dangerous was on the loose, the investigators will hopefully be nervous and a little trigger happy. When Red Jake launches at them, they will be expecting much more than a desperate homeless man. This is your classic subverted trope, or bait and switch. Once the investigators realize their mistake, trying to de-escalate the situation becomes an interesting challenge. Trying to do so whilst getting Red Jake to stick around is going to test the social skills of the investigators. After all the reading and gentle investigation up to now, it is really something that brings the scenario to a point of high stakes and tension, which is much needed. The second highlight is the ritual itself. Now we're in dramatic horror film territory. Trying to maintain the ritual whilst the evil thing tries to stop you is reminiscent of films like The Exorcist or Poltergeist. I've only played this online, but the idea of having the players sitting around the table maintaining some physical sign of their chanting, or if you can get your players to agree, chanting, seems like a fun minigame in of itself. In any case, there is a rolling series of encounters that should give the more combat-capable investigators some overdue spotlight time. Of course, players who are easily distracted may break immersion, and so this is a tricky bit to pull off, especially online. However, it's the great payoff of this scenario, and you should make the most of the scene. What doesn't work? As an introduction to Call of Cthulhu, this feels a little bit old school. There is a lot of reading materials given up front to the players. Although it is not in the same league as some of the great epic campaigns, it is substantial. These big exposition dumps are hardly the way I like to introduce anyone to a game. More so when they seem to repeat themselves several times. Whilst the notion of having clues that lead the investigators forward in multiple places is a good one, having the same information presented to the players repeatedly in succession feels like you're expecting to play with unfocused goldfish. There is little in the introductory material that will naturally spark ideas for investigative paths for new players. This is a problem, especially given the volume of text they've just consumed. They will probably need guidance and prodding to even think of places they may go for further clues. Their instincts may well be to go straight to the farmhouse. And on this occasion, their instincts would be right, because the whole investigative portion is entirely optional and doesn't give them much besides drag the whole thing out. Okay, there's a little clue about the wards somewhere. But more or less, there's not much here. Everything they will need to complete the scenario is in the trunk in the cellar. Nothing they learn at the police station, coroners, or even the library, or elsewhere, is going to make a really meaningful difference. Which is a great shame. This is called Cthulhu. The investigation, the library visits, and talking to law enforcement or whoever else is a great part of the fun. Of course, this scenario does merit the investigation for the colour it provides. It is fun. Role-playing opportunities abound. Players will do crazy things when things go wrong, like 
punching a police officer and running off with the file they couldn't fast talk their way into obtaining. The librarian they meet may prove one of the most memorable NPCs they encounter. A knowing player may recognize the named character from Lovecraft's fiction. There are rewards to doing this beyond those fundamental to succeeding in the goal of the scenario, but it makes no meaningful difference if the players completely skip this, and this to me is bad design for an adventure designed to instill in a new Call of Cthulhu player the value of investigation. Make it your own. One way to fix the investigation phase is to use the familiar structure of having the investigators gather the parts they need to perform the ritual from the various locations prior to going to the farmhouse. Merryweather's letter could give them clear guidance as to where each thing may be found or was at least last seen. In order not to block the scenario because of her failed role, retrieval of these items may be guaranteed as long as the players go to the location. Skill checks would just up the stakes or unlock some of the background colour that the scenario already offers. Another way to improve the scenario is to work on the investigators and make sure there is a lot of depth to their relationships with each other and with Merriweather. The pregens with their loose connection to society for investigators may work as a stopgap, but I think you can get a lot more out of the scenario if there is more motivation to the player characters. At the very least, you want to make a note of persons in their backstory that act as their touchstones to use in the final scene when the lurker tries to lure them out. The various investigation scenes can also be spun out to have more peril and danger in them. Perhaps by introducing discreetly agents of the Dark Brotherhood, who may not be so extinct after all. Obvious places for such events would be when the investigators are snooping around for information about Marion Allen's death, or if the investigators manage to get their hands on the Divermi Mystery from the Miskatonics Library. Your investigators may also elect to widen their sphere of investigation talking to Rupert's widow or the husband of Maggie McFurter. There are plenty of opportunities to expand this adventure into a number of sessions and allow your players to really explore the world of 1920s Arkham. By now, I've introduced a few people online to Call of Cthulhu and had a lot of fun doing so. There are many varied scenarios that can work, but if you allow me, I'd like to suggest what I consider some of the essential elements of a beginner-friendly scenario that truly captures what makes this game special. Firstly is the hook. I think there are some classic tropes for how a bunch of investigators get roped into a scenario's plot, and they can all work well but I think you have to strike a balance between too little and too much exposition up front. On the too little side, you have scenarios that basically say, you are down in the cellar, or you are in some cabin in the woods. Okay, but why? Give the player characters some motivation. And on the other end of the scale, you have scenarios that ask the players to read pages and pages of backstory up front. Or worse, get the keeper to read them. There is a happy medium between these two extremes. Sadly, I think Edge of Darkness veers off this by a noticeable margin. Second, there is the investigation. I think the criteria for a good investigation are fairly easy to meet. One, The investigation should test a variety of character types. This means there should be some clues available for basic research skills such as spot hidden or library use. There should be some clues available to specialist skills you know the investigators will need such as languages or archaeology or some science. There should also be some clues unlocked by the appropriate social skills, such as charm, fast talk, persuasion, or psychology. Cover the bases so that all the investigators feel like they are helping. 2. The investigation should not get stuck because of a bad dice roll. The essential clues must come for free. 3. 
The investigation should be meaningful. It should turn up information that will not only provide colour and build up dread, but will be useful to the investigators. Piecing together the mystery should result in something actionable that may even mean the difference between death and survival. The final element of what makes the scenario is the confrontation. This is what makes each scenario unique. It may be going into the haunted house or abandoned lighthouse. It may be exploring the caves beneath the old mansion, or it may be performing a ritual to expel some otherworldly entity. Whatever it is, it needs to be interactive, challenging, and dangerous. This is what the players will remember. Ideally, what happens here will be heavily foreshadowed in the investigation, and the investigators will have earned some path to success by their due diligence. Investigators who wander blindly into the confrontation at the end should suffer the appropriate fate. I think those three parts, the hook, the investigation, and the confrontation, summarize nearly everything you need in an introductory adventure for Call of Cthulhu. I won't be bold enough to say that is all you need for any fun adventure of Call of Cthulhu. I'm sure other formats are possible. But I will say those longer scenarios that don't do these three things well tend to drag. They may mix in other elements or repeat some elements over numerous scenes or chapters, but you have to get those elements right for a fun time at the gaming table. How it played. I'm now joined by Matthew, one of the players who played Edge of Darkness. If I remember correctly, Matthew, you played as one of your recurring characters, Frederick Herzog, is that right? Yeah, yeah. Um, just gonna be Fre- Friedrich. I refer to him as Friedrich. Friedrich, my bad. Sorry, my bad. no, I should have pointed it out before, but yeah, Friedrich. And uh, he's, he he played a few adventures. He he, uh, as a spoiler, he he managed to survive this particular one, right? He has, yeah. Uh, I think third or fourth I'm on right now with him. I don't recall exactly, but yeah, yeah that's pretty good going for a Call of Cthulhu character when we're doing a series of one shots. Oh no, absolutely. Uh, I think going back a bit now for this one, what were the highlights of the scenario for you? Yeah, I think what was what really worked was, you know, trying to find our with the group, you know, trying to find our way around the mystery. And if I remember correctly, um, we decided to go to sort of a small town and, you know, have some interactions with with the local the local people and you know, uh, sort of a cast of weirdos coming in, um, really sort of allow for some really interesting and um, fun sort of role playing opportunities. I think it was a, it's it's an interesting one. It's got a little bit of a build up, a, a bit of time for you to find the character. It yes, yes, and uh, there's there's it's good because for for. For your character, what I liked about it, for you know, figuring out Friedrich, there was opportunities before we went into sort of the the sort of the the crux of the, the scenario or the the, the main problem. Uh, I was able to like find his find my way with him and you know figure out the other characters as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and uh, there's a it's an interesting uh, case as well with uh, Merriweather. Do you recall the kind of the broad strokes of what he did in that scenario? Yeah, yeah. So that's right. So we had because he was the last. Uh, him and his his um, college pals were messing around and conjured a spirit, uh, and it was our yeah, yeah. Because I think it sort of worked great because again. Yeah, so it's a very interesting scenario too because we were sort of thrown into this situation where we also had to solve another person's problem, but also a problem that none of us really sort of believed, you know, based upon sort of you know how the scenario is supposed to go. Where you know we had to solve this problem that didn't seem real, you know, with working with Meriwether or working for Meriwether to sort of recapture this spirit him and his friends sort of conjured created sort of interesting potential consequences 
because, you know, we're kind of not responsible for it, but also there's this evil spirit. And so, you know, how do you, how do you navigate as a character, you know, uh, whether you, 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 you die for this or whether you sort of, you know, cut your losses and leave at, at, um, when things get hairy. And what bits didn't you think work so well? Yeah. So I think, I think this is, this one's probably a matter of, you know, figuring out your lore master, your GM and the players. I, I think we were close to solving the issue or, you know, um, re, um, returning the spirit back or the monster back. But then I, I don't remember if it was a, the player said either in or out of character made a joke. And so the ritual required a certain number of people to, to, to do the chant. And um, you as the, you run the game just uh, made the decision that the chant was broken and the spirit like, or the monster was then sort of repowered or we had to start over and um, things were getting serious enough and people were dying or close to dying that, it was basically lost. So I guess, you know, setting that up, I think what was frustrating was, you know, you, I think you very fairly set out the expectation that, you know, these sort of superfluous comments will be taken as in character and that, you know, you need to sort of maintain focus on the story and, you know, it's always tough as, you know, running games, whether you, how you handle those, those little side comments from, from, from players. Um, I think that was the one thing that, that really struck out to me that was f frustrating. So I think, again, I think one of the things with the one shots, and especially if you're doing it with a new group of people, is, you know, making sure you have those expectations and they're understood and that, make sure the players respect them so it doesn't you know affect the the uh the play and the fun of others yeah that, that's a fair comment i think it's actually one of the aspects of the the published adventure where you sh you're encouraged to kind of get the people i think if you're playing in person you're meant to you can use a visual cue or something and uh, if someone like you put your hand on your head or something and <laughs> and if they move their hand off the head they've broken the ritual or something like that it's just uh le ratcheting off the tension I, I do recall there there was um a couple of moments where we let it slide and then it was just like just constant dialogue that was happening and i was like okay you're obviously not maintaining the ritual. did you feel the outcome was in your hands could you see it ending differently well, you know, as I sort of mentioned, there was, uh, I don't remember, I can't remember if Friedrich was involved in the chanting or not. Yeah, so yes and no. You know, we all sat down, all the characters sat down to sort of perform the ritual, and then there were, at moments, decisions to break the circle to either protect the party or to protect yourself. And so um, there, there was a lot of sort of, agency in that um you know as we you know as i mentioned sort of someone sort of broke the ritual because of their sort of their their jokes um so you know that you know unfortunately is um something that sort of fell out of my control but i think one of the curious things about this scenario but all, and also a lot of sort of call of cthulhu is that so much of it does seem out of your hands where you're, you know, you're fighting these forces that are unknown and extraordinarily powerful. So I think that lack of control and that lack of, you know, not necessarily being here. You know, you don't know if you're going to be here. You don't know if you're going to win. You don't know if you're going to survive. I I like that about the system. You know, there's it's 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 just you know again it's a strange balance where like, yeah it's a very deadly system, very deadly scenario but you know you have to make a choice on how you react to the problems um and so it's in your it's in your hands that way what did you think of the tone of the adventure i think it was a very i think it was, it was solid especially if it's your first one into it i think this has been my second with this group and i thought it worked really well 
because again, sort of there was sort of the slow build up, sort of a slow burn until then it sort of really escalated. And you're able to sort of figure out the, you know, you're able to sort of then, you know, figure out what the story is doing and, uh, um, you know, uh, not not get suddenly overwhelmed by these sort of creatures from, uh, you know, the, the great beyond you know, of attacking you sort of in the first five minutes. And the final question. What would you add or change about the scenario if you were to run it for yourself? So I guess one question I had, uh, were, are there pre-gen characters that go with this? Good question. I think they might be some in the starter set, because I think this is from the starter set. But I, I don't think, I think I made a conscious decision early on that I'd let players make their own characters for these. So I think what I would maybe, I'm I'm very happy that I was able to you know, create and choose to, to go with Friedrich. Uh, if I were running it and if it was, and this, you know, and I think this, this is being informed by the recent games we've, we played. Um, I would probably maybe have some pre-gen just so, you know, the lore master and the players kind of know who they have and who they're working with just so, you know, you can easier to sort of guide the story and, you also don't get maybe too invested in your character at the moment, just so you can sort of figure out the tone and figure out the pacing and figure out the rules of Call of Cthulhu. Because again, how many times Friedrich has survived the these one shots is astonishing. Um, and I, yeah, um, I think that's one of the things that I would do if I were sort of running the game. Thanks. That's good advice. I think... Yeah, I'm coming around to the use of pre-gens myself. I've found um, the the particularly the, the gateways of terror one. They they work really well. The ones that came with the keepers screen pack two scenarios we did weren't so f- much fun. They they're all mobsters, so they didn't work for at least one run through. Uh, but they were some of them were good. You know, I think we did that was the first one we. What is it? Misuse was the first one, right? We did we did uh, some pre gens for, but uh, final kind of like open question for you: uh, Is there anything else you'd want to add about this scenario from your recollection of it? I appreciate it's a bit back in time since we last played this. I think one thing that worked well and that I don't think it would have to change, which I think kind of surprises me, and I think about it was I didn't feel as a player I didn't feel lost on what to do next. It seemed. I think the scenario and how it was ran um, is set up to be very open, but there's also a very sort of linear process to it. Like you, there's sort of one one or two directions you could go, and it would it would be very hard to sort of get off that. But I, you know, again, I still felt there was control I had, and there was sort of decisions I could make. Um, you know, at the start, um, when we first meet with Meriwether when we sort of get to you on each other as a party to sort of very end. And finally. Edge of Darkness has a very memorable confrontation with a Mythos creature that will genuinely rattle the nerves of your players, especially if you can get the maintaining the ritual mechanism right. What it lacks is a meaningful investigation portion, and its approach to presenting the expedition to the players in the first place is a little cack-handed, Despite this, it can be a lot of fun, and for little tweaking, these problems can be overcome. Thank you for listening to Run the Adventure with me, your host, Sid Razavi. I'd love to hear any feedback, questions, or your thoughts in this episode. You can reach me on email gm at runtheadventure, or one word, dot com, or find me on Twitter at rta underscore podcast. If you liked what you heard, please do consider leaving a rating or review on iTunes or wherever you found this pod. Even better, please share the pod with your friends and on social media. Links to today's adventure are available on the show notes and on the website www.runtheadventure.com. Until the next episode, may your adventure run fantastic.